Now we're into the late 50s. They've established the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. They picked this location in the hills of West Virginia. I think, as I said last time, optical observatories you build on top of the mountains to minimize the amount of air between you and space. To radio, the air doesn't matter at all, not in this wavelength regime. And so you actually put them in valleys, and you use the mountains to shield out radio noise from civilization. Civilization, as you can imagine, makes a lot of radio noise. All of you with your wireless devices. Now, if you go to Green Bank, uh, you've got to turn all the wireless off, the airplane mode, everything. Even the microwaves are in rooms surrounded by wire mesh. So you have to go in two sets of doors. I mean, it's, it's, it's a radio, nationally um, determined radio dead zone. The cell phones don't work. You're not allowed to have them. There are people who work there that monitor the radio spectrum. They're allowed to. They're allowed to listen to cell phone communication, baby monitors, whatever. And they'll track you down, even if you're 10, 20, 30 miles away. So you turn that thing off. It's a radio dead zone. It's a very low population area, poor area of West Virginia, very pretty. Uh, but they chose it out of various locations due to its proximity to D.C., Washington, D.C., a semi-political decision. There are now other national radio astronomy observatory sites, Socorro, New Mexico, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, some other places. Anyway, this is the first, and it's close to the headquarters. So they started building these. This is an 85-foot dish. It's kind of the standard. Uh, there's so many of these around now. Uh, like everyone and their grandmother has an 85-foot radio telescope. <laughs> now, if you look at it, it moves a little different. It's not an altitude azimuth. It's built tipped on the side. That main axis there points to the North Star. So rotating around that is right ascension, and the other wheel, which you can't really see very well, is declination. Because the previous telescopes were out as, but this one here, this is um, the, um, yeah, yeah, it's the tablet. It's one of the 85s. They're in equatorial coordinates. That's RA deck. There's a reason they're doing that. You can imagine from an engineering point of view, it's challenging to build a big, heavy telescope on gears that are mounted at some weird angle with respect to gravity. Well, think of it this way. With this kind of design, if you want to track a star, you just have to move one gear at a uniform rate. The right ascension gear, the big wheel that you're seeing right here. Stars move across the sky uniformly in right ascension. You just rotate this uniformly and you track the star. Simple to do. But in an out as telescope, you have to move two gears simultaneously at different rates. And figure out how to do it right requires some computation. Back then, computers were incredibly expensive. They'd fill this room. They cost far more than the telescope itself. So you don't buy the computer. You instead build your telescope up on this weird axis. Small optical telescopes are built this way still. Um, but that is why you have this giant thing in an equatorial mount. And this one, uh, this one's called the Tattle. It's kind of interesting. It's the first one for which a search for extraterrestrial intelligence was done. Project Ozma, it was called back then. Oz is in The Wizard of Oz, and done by Frank Drake. In the last class of the semester, we'll take a look at Drake's equation, which is a way of estimating how many civilizations might be out there trying to communicate back to us. Anyway, the first search was done on that, didn't find anything. A wide, wide array of searches have been done since. No one's ever found anything. We'll come back to that in the last day of the semester. In here, you can see they built three of them. They actually built four. These three are spaced out in a line, and there's a fourth one up on that distant mountain. It's not there anymore, but there used to be. And we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but this was exploring a new technology called interferometry, where if you have many telescopes working together, they can act in terms of the angular resolution as if they're a telescope as big as the space in between them. Just tuck that in the back of your head. We'll come back to it. Okay, then once they built that, they said, okay, we want something bigger. And so they built the 140 foot. That's what it's called, the 140 foot. Beautiful telescope. It's my favorite telescope in the world. Uh, it's enormous. I mean, that's half a football field across the lip of the dish. Beautiful kind of naval design if you're there. It's the world's largest equatorially mounted telescope. It sits on a, a ball bearing, the largest ball bearing in the world, 17 feet across. And you can see the uh, right ascension axis here. This points to the North Star. Here's the right ascension axis. 
and this is declination. And this did all sorts of groundbreaking science. It's still a functioning telescope, though it is becoming a somewhat dated instrument at this point. Suppose you need to work on the receiver. How do you do that? It's like a zillion stories up. Here's a modern day picture of it with something bigger being built in the background. If you want to work on that receiver, I don't have a picture of it in this configuration, but oops, you tilt the telescope all the way down so the lip is almost touching the ground. Then you push this whole building into place and you climb up the stairs and you can work on the receiver. Then you push the building back and it goes back into action. If you want to look at different wavelengths, you have to change the receiver. And say receiver, it's like having a one pixel camera at prime focus. You can't make pictures, you can just measure how bright is the radio sky at this point. If you want to make a picture, you go from point to point to point. Very slow to make pictures in the radio. But it's a beast of a telescope. So these are huge, huge structures, and begs the question, why are they building them so big? To answer this, let's go back to our, our angular resolution equation, our blurring equation. So theta is 0.25 arc seconds times the wavelength measured in microns divided by the diameter of the telescope measured in meters. We use this for our visible light telescopes. It's true for telescopes of any wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the more blurring you get. The smaller the telescope, the more blurring you get. Now here, a micron, that's kind of like the boundary between visible and infrared. Infrared, near infrared anyways, one, two microns. Visible is half a micron, something like that. But the radio, the wavelengths are huge. They're not measured in microns, they're measured in centimeters. You can see these wavelengths. There's, I mean, you don't see them because it's radio, but you can see these scales. And so I'll write down another version. It's equivalent. You could convert centimeters to microns and use this. It come out in arc seconds, but if you make the wavelength so huge, you're going to expect the blurring scale to be huge. In the radio, it's typically not arc seconds, but arc minutes, or even degrees, as your blurring scale. So here's the same equation, just with different units. 40 arc minutes, not arc seconds, but arc minutes, times the wavelength measured in centimeters, divided by the diameter measured in meters. So in the homework, there's one question where you can compute the angular resolution of a large radio telescope. Again, you can do the conversions or you can use this simpler equation. It comes out in arc minutes. In 40 arc minutes, it's pretty close to a degree. If you're dealing with a big wavelength or a small telescope, the blurring scale can actually be a degree or more. What's that mean? Like a degree seems like a small thing. But remember, we divide the degrees into arc minutes, the arc minutes into arc seconds. In astronomer, arc second is the scale at least a visible light astronomer is the scale over which things are blurry. Degree is huge. One degree in the sky, you have a bajillion stars and all sorts of things going on. It's kind of like me taking my glasses off. I, I can see you all have heads, right? I can't see your eyes. I don't know if you have mouths or ears or anything like that. I can see you have heads and bodies. That's what it's like observing in the radio. The wavelength is so huge, the blurring scale is huge. And so the only way that you can battle that is to build a larger telescope. In fact, you have to build a monstrously large to take care of the large wavelength. And that's what you're going to see is the practice here. So that's part of what the 140 was about. So here's a picture of it at night, just a beautiful telescope. And then they said, well, we still have a little bit of money. We built our 85, we built our 140, we could build a 300-foot telescope. And so here it is, but they didn't have enough money to do it right. And they knew that, so they took a number of shortcuts. First of all, it can't point anywhere in the sky. It just moves north and south, north and south. So if you want to observe something, you have to wait for it to hit the meridian, and then you tip the telescope to that angle, and you observe it as it goes across. You say have one shot per day. That's one way in which they uh, save money. It saves engineering money if it doesn't have to point everywhere. It just moves in that one direction. Of course, if you want to look low in the horizon, you have to build a telescope pretty high up in the air so it doesn't run into the ground. And that costs money to hold this. I mean, that's a football field across. To hold that up, uh, the higher up you want to hold it steady, the more it costs. So they didn't build it very high up. And indeed, if you were to look at the horizon, it would run into the ground. So they dug a big ditch. 
So if they want to look at the horizon, it goes half underground, and you just use the half of the telescope, or two-thirds of the telescope that's above ground. It's another way they save money. You can see through it. You can see it from this picture here. You can actually put your fingers through it. It's a mesh. And you may wonder, what's up with that? You may wonder, why don't these things look like mirrors? You know, even the previous ones, so you have a parabolic surface, but it doesn't look like a mirror. And that has to do with the wavelength that you're looking at. Here's the parabolic surface. It needs to be smooth. The rule of thumb is one-tenth the wavelength. So suppose it's an optical mirror. You're looking at 500 nanometer light. So the wavelength's really short, just this distance here. It has to be smooth to about 50 nanometers. Suppose it's not. Suppose here we have 500 nanometer deviations across the mirror. And here's our focal point. As the light comes in, we want it. I'm sorry, let's just have a 500 nanometer light coming down. You want it to bounce off and go here. If the wavelength is the same size as the roughness of the mirror, it could bounce off in weird ways and go anywhere. So in the visible, it needs to be smooth to 50 nanometers, and that gives you a polished mirror. It requires a polished mirror to be that smooth. But in the radio, a typical wavelength is maybe, well, a typical wavelength is 21 centimeters. Cold hydrogen gas has an emission line at 21 centimeters. Most of the universe is cold hydrogen gas. So this is a really great thing. Uh, you can observe it this wavelength. But your telescope needs to be smooth to about one-tenth the wavelength, or about two centimeters. So you can have deformities of about two centimeters if you want to look at this wavelength. So you don't have to polish a mirror. You can bend sheet metal. It works. In this case, they just put down a mesh. And there are holes, about one centimeter holes. You can almost stick your fingers through it. And it's OK, because the holes are smaller than one-tenth the wavelength. So the wavelength comes and bounces off the mesh. It's much bigger than the hole, so it bounces. It doesn't go through. The disadvantage is you can't look at short wavelengths. The short wavelengths do go through. They're very inexpensive, but you can't do short radio wavelengths. You can't do high-frequency radio. So that's one limitation. Also, from an engineering point of view, you know, the way you drill the holes or press the bolts, they took shortcuts there, and they knew it. And they said, this thing's only going to stand for five years. And during that five years, we're going to just run it back and forth. It's suit like Reber's original design. just goes up and down. And so you move it to different angles and catch the whole sky as it goes by. Now, since they knew it was only going to last five years, I have no idea why they built the control room underneath it. Not smart. But they got their money's worth. It lasted 25 years. And the operator, I met the guy who was there, and he was just recently hired. He, he was there doing the night shift, working in this control room, and an I-beam comes through the ceiling and lands right next to him. And he's like, oh, something fell off the telescope, and he went out and got in the car and drove up, up to the 140, which was command control at the time. And they came back with flashlights and tried to figure out which I-beam fell off, and they're like, there's no telescope there. The whole thing had actually fallen down, and he didn't even realize it because it was so dark that night. <laughs> he just came out the front door and got in his car and drove, <laughs> and drove away and came back. Like, where's the telescope? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Folded up like a Japanese fan. So, they ran down the road the next morning. The person who designed it was still there 25 years later. I said, hey, you got to come see. Your telescope's collapsed. He was retired at this point, working in his garden. He said, well, it's about time, and went back to his gardening. <laughs> Despite his disinterest, they were able to pull him out of retirement to build a replacement. Here it is, the Green Bank Telescope, GBT. Again, the acronyms are not that creative. The politics of this is kind of interesting. At the time, Senator Byrd, uh, who was recently deceased uh, about a year or so ago, was a senator from West Virginia and head of financial appropriations, and the Democrats controlled Congress, so he was in charge of the box. And he was like, damn it, I want to replace my telescope. And uh, those, of, you know, those who live outside West Virginia kind of, he has this name, the King of the Pork. But inside West Virginia, they just refer to him as God himself, because he brings so much money to that state. And this is one of his big projects, brought a lot of money in and built this thing. I'm not complaining as an astronomer. I kind of like it. Actually, I've watched the thing be built. I've been going here since 1991. 
and they started construction of this in 96 and completed a number of years ago. But it's been fun to watch this thing be built. It's the largest moving thing on land, period. Not moving lar largest moving telescope, largest moving thing on land. Aircraft carriers move and they're bigger than this, but that's about it. All sorts of nifty features to this telescope. Well, first of all, this is built in the azimuth system. It's on a ring that rotates, and there's just one angle pivot. So if you want to track a source across the sky, you've got to pivot as you're rotating. And it requires a computer, but you know, we have computers these days. So they did build this in the equatorial system, built in the azimuth altitude system. So here's a still picture of it uh, at night. It's pretty cool. They light it all up so airplanes don't hit it. Uh, seriously, those are airplane lights, the red ones around it. It's taller than the Statue of Liberty, almost as tall as the Washington Monument. It's big. It's uh, a little bit egg-shaped. It's 300 by 320 feet. There's a reason for that. There's a number of special things about it. First of all, it's open aperture. If you consider most radio telescopes, looking down at it, here's your receiver. It doesn't float there. It's held by these supports. As the radio waves come down, they have to get around these supports, and you get diffraction. They get in the way. They mess up your images and your data. So they said, why don't we, on paper, envision a 600-foot telescope? The receiver would be here in the middle, but then only build this kind of egg-shaped side of it, where it's 320 by 300. And that's what they did. So this is a piece of a much bigger parabola, but now the receiver is off axis, it's not in the way, there's no support structure in the way. So the light comes down, it bounces off this surface, it goes up to the secondary mirror, uh, bounces off the secondary, and then down into this room, kind of hard to see, maybe you can see it in, yeah, here it is. There's the sub-reflector, there's the room. That room's like four times the size of the AV room uh, behind you. And in there they have all sorts of receivers, all different sizes to work at all sorts of different wavelengths, and you can just rotate the one you want into position. Another nifty thing about this is it has an active optic system. You don't have to worry about uh, the atmosphere. There's no atmospheric blurring. But you do have to worry about the shape of the dish. Now, for example, when it's pointing straight up, it's designed to be a parabola. But as it gets tipped over in different ways, gravity pulls on this monstrous thing in all sorts of different ways and directions, and it becomes non-parabolic. So what they do is they put it into a particular position, like gravity distorted it as it's going to, then there's a system of 12 infrared lasers around it, and it scans the whole surface of the dish. It doesn't do this every time you move. It does it like once a year and builds it up into a file. Scans the surface, realizes how gravity's tugging on it. It builds a model in the computer showing how far it is from being perfectly parabolic, and then sends commands to pistons underneath each of the 2,000 and some panels that make up the surface, pushing it back into perfect parabolic shape. So it morphs back into a parabola, each time it moves, they know how to morph it back into the proper shape. Comes complete with two elevators and so forth. Uh, it's a nifty, nifty uh, telescope. Can we make them bigger? The answer is yes, we can. It just can't be fully movable. Now, some of you might recognize this one. Uh, this is the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. They basically found a valley shaped like a parabola and hung a net. It looks up. Now you do have some flexibility. You see the receiver hanging over the telescope. You can pull it a little bit to the left and use this piece of the telescope to look that way. You can pull a little bit to the right and use this piece of the telescope to look that way. So it can see a band on the sky. It's not just a line on the sky, but a band. Kind of like the SALT telescope where we can adjust in a similar way. Now, this has been in some movies. Anyone know what movie this older movie? In James Bond and Goldeneye and also Contact. In Goldeneye, they're in Cuba and this radio transmitter comes up from under a lake. But it really was filmed here in Puerto Rico. And it's big. It's a thousand feet across. 